Let us start a new topic, International Factor Mobility. And we have used a two-factor model, labor and capital. So what we look at is the movement of labor and capital across nations. And as a first step, we'll look at international labor migration. Let us look at the numbers relating to international labor migration. And as a first step, we'll look at this table, which gives you the percentage of foreign-born people out of total population in 2010. And look at the world total. It's 3.1%. That means 3% of the world population lives outside the country where they were born. And the population of the world in 2010 was 7 billion. And so if 3.1% of the people were living outside the country they were born, there were about 210 million people who could be considered migrants. And as you go through this list, look at the country of China. And in China, we see only 0.1% of the population is foreign born. Compare this to European Union, 9.5%, US about 14%, Canada 21%, Singapore in Far East about 38.7% and Qatar 73.9%. So some countries have more migrants living in their country and some have very few. And it's not very difficult to visualize the reasons as to why this happens, why some countries we have higher foreign-born population and why in some countries we have lower foreign-born population. Another thing we should know is the difference between permanent and temporary migration. By permanent migration we mean when migrants come to these countries there is a clear path to citizenship and so these people become the nationals of these countries. So countries like US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, etc., they permit permanent migration. So once you enter, you follow the procedures and you can become a national of these countries. Then we also see what is called temporary migration. Where, and in Western Europe, it is called the guest worker program. So you go there for work purposes and as soon as your work is over, you return to your home country. This happens in Europe. This also happens in the Middle East as well. Now let us just focus on what is happening to the US. I've already stated in the previous table that 14% of the total population in the US in 2010 was foreign born. Since the population of the US in 2010, the total population was 308 million people. That means about 42 million people in the U.S. were foreign-born. What are some of the facts relating to labor migration to the U.S.? Look at the following. 50% of PhDs in engineering, and this includes computer science, math, and so on, <coughs> all these are foreign-born. In economics, my field, about 40% of the PhDs are foreign-born. In the U.S., there's a shortage of medical doctors and what we find is 27% of physicians and surgeons in the US are foreign born. And we also have a shortage of healthcare providers and we see 22% of healthcare providers in the US are foreign born. And so, and this it's very easy for us to reason that people who are permitted to migrate, particularly the skilled workers, there must be a shortage in the U.S. to permit such a huge amount of migration of skilled workers. And this migration of skilled workers must be distinguished from unskilled workers, which are workers who have low or are semi-skilled workers. There's legal migration as well as illegal migration. And in the U.S., about 12 million migrants were illegal and out of these 12 million illegal immigrants 7 million had 
low to semi skill so you should keep this in the background as we analyze the consequences causes as well as the consequences of international labor migration us is called the country of immigrants so let us briefly look at the different waves of people coming to the us where they came from and in the initial period which is called the colonial period in 16 and 1700 or the 17th or 18th century most of the people who came to the us were from britain and africa and then as us started to industrialize we see a number of people move from northern europe scandinavian countries like sweden and so on ireland iceland and other countries from northern europe and then in the late 19th to early 20th century most of the people who came from the came to the us were from south or eastern part of europe so italy greece and so on and in the previous century and there was a legal case and the us came up with what is called an immigration act of 1924 and that's when they decided that the migrants should be based on existing ethnic composition of us population in 1920 that simply means whatever population we had wherever these migrants were coming from the us decided to keep that particular composition the same so after 1924 people were permitted from europe and from different parts and so that's what happened in 1924 and then in 1960s the us had civil rights movement and one of the consequences of that was there was an immigration act of 1965 and us decided to welcome immigrants from different parts of the world and not just confine immigrants to european countries and so from 1965 onwards what we have seen is an increase in migrants coming from asia and latin america and in 2016 or if you look at the last 4 to 5 years what has happened is initially after 1965 most of the migrants came from latin america and in the recent years we have seen more and more migration from asian countries rather than central and latin american countries now let us look at reasons for migration and before we do that just remember the following i moved from india to the us and in my case india will be called the source country and for me us will be called the host country and there are several reasons as to why people migrate and what we do is we look at the reasons for people migrating in the source country as well as the host country the factors that we have in the source country are called push factors they push people to look around the world and then they find some attractive countries and factors we have in these attractive countries are called pull factors so one way to look at push and pull factors is they are inverses of one another now as far as the push factors go and we know this is exactly the opposite of pull factors there could be several reasons on the economic social or political side consider the economic factors if you look at the uk in early part of 1980s because of budget considerations there was a freeze on salaries of professors in different universities and colleges and some of these professors are very well renowned either they had received nobel prize or were going to receive a nobel prize they had the potential to do so but they faced a salary freeze they looked around the world and what they found is in the us they could get about 2 to 3 times of what they were getting in the uk they could get that much salary in the us 
So salary freeze became a push factor for these British professors and the salaries in the US became the pull factor for, uh, for these British professors and thus we see a huge amount of migration of academics from the UK to the US in early part of 1980s. Some of the factors could be social factors, either could, it could be religious persecution or things like that. Another reason could be political factors. Look at the following and maybe all three of them combined together. Look at another thing. Now, the Soviet Union country we had was broken down into different parts in late 1980s. So we have countries like Russia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan and so on. And so uh, the former Soviet Union was in deep economic trouble and there was a lot of social as well as political instability and uncertainty. And, and, and the former Soviet Union had very talented research scientists. So what we found in late 80s and 1990s that a number of top scientists from former Soviet Union moved to the US simply because of factors on economic, social as well as political side. So we have reasons for why people migrate and they could be on the push fact on the push side and that happens in the source country or on the pull side which happens in the host country.